Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Voltaggio, a senior content manager at Equifax, standing in for our regular host, Catherine Doe. The era of cheap bank deposits is over and financial institutions have become more risk-aware following interest rate hikes, an uncertain economy, and now the challenges facing regional banks. On today's episode, we'll be talking about how financial institutions can leverage a deposit growth strategy to reduce their risk, and how data is an important component of that strategy. I'm joined by Tom O'Neill, a risk consultant at Equifax, and Mark Toro, a marketing consulting leader in our financial service group at Equifax. Before we get started, let's have a quick economic update from David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David, over to you. So consumer sentiment unexpectedly fell in March. This was after three straight gains. So we've looked at preliminary data coming through from the University of Michigan, and a couple factors have contributed to this drop in sentiment. You know, there's gas prices have been rising. There's been a downward trend in equity prices since early February. There's a bit of a rebound there in March, but still it's overall a downward trend. And the labor market has been mixed. Job growth is still strong, but nominal wage growth does appear to be slowing. We're also watching consumer inflation expectations, which have trended lower, but they do remain higher than they were prior to COVID-19. But the good news is when we look at the New York Fed's index of three-year inflation expectations, it's the closest to returning to the pre-pandemic level that it's been. University of Michigan is directionally similar. So some good news on terms of those expectations. But, you know, the big news recently is related to the bank failures. And, you know, we think the economy will struggle with slow growth this year and it will remain vulnerable to events like this banking crisis. But it's unlikely that this event's going to push the economy into a recession. So we think the impact of the failures is going to be modest, though this is a, a very uncertain environment and events are unfolding very quickly. We think the, the biggest hit to growth will come from tightening or further tightening of bank lending standards. And this is going to result in weaker credit. Small and mid-sized banks with less than $250 billion in assets will be the most cautious. And they do quite a bit of lending. So they're going to account for half of CNI lending. They're going to account for about half of consumer lending, two-thirds of residential mortgage lending, and more than three-quarters of commercial mortgage lending. So they carry quite a bit of weight in the economy, and there will be a drag from the contraction in lending, even if it's slight. What will offset some of that, though, is there will be a decline in interest rates. So in particular, if you think about mortgage rates, so fixed mortgage rates, which were about 7% prior to the failures, are now closer to 6.5%. All of these different cross currents in the economy are going to reduce real GDP growth by about 0.2 percentage points. We were anticipating that by the end of this year, GDP would be up by 1.5%. So now it's going to come in at 1.3%. Again, this very modest growth, and it's going to be a struggle. But overall, the economy is set to still avoid a recession as we see it. Thank you, David. Welcome, Tom and Mark. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Olivia. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you, Olivia. Tom, let's start with you. For those of us who aren't familiar with the deposit growth strategy, what is it? Well, it's it's pretty much what it sounds like. It is the desire for banks and other institutions to grow the amount of deposits they have on hand. And that's important because that's that's how banks do business. Obviously, you know, banks make money by lending that out while they need to have that money to lend out. And that's where deposits play such a critical role. And historically, that's never really much of an issue. I mean, consumers need to put their money somewhere. They put it somewhere safe like a bank. And, and so fighting for a deposit, so to speak, has never been too much of an issue. But recently, yeah, that's changed. The Fed has raised interest rates and it's, it's a desire to combat inflation. And in many cases, that's given consumers attractive options to deposits. And so rather than make very little off of your traditional savings account or, or whatnot, you can invest those in treasury bills. And a lot, of, a lot of consumers, but also a lot of small businesses and other commercial enterprises are doing just that. And that 
makes things tough from the deposit side. And that's why we're hearing uh, so much interest in how do we grow these deposits. And, and it's also why we're seeing so many uh, banks having to do things like raise the saving rates to levels that were unheard of just a year or so ago. Yes, to your point, Tom, this topic has gone from being a top conversation item with our clients to front page news recently. Can you explain what's been going on and how it's related to what we're discussing? Sure. Well, obviously, it's it's never as easy as just saying it's one thing. And so if they just got deposits, everything would be fine. Uh, it's a lot more complex than what we're hearing in the news these days, but it is all related. It's in fact, in some cases, what we're seeing, you know, some, some recent headlines actually involves deposits, but from a slightly different angle. We've seen the headlines of, of banks where the reverse is almost true. They have deposits that are in excess of the 250000 yeah, insured amount. And so that money is is kind of at risk for those depositors. You know, if something were to happen to the bank, the government only covers up to the first 250000 But even that, you figure, okay, well, that's only if something happens to the bank. You know, it's, it's fine. But then when you start combining that with the impacts of inflation and the, the fact that that makes a lot of those loans that banks made previously, you know, a lot less valuable. Now you're starting to see weaknesses, you know, pop up. And what happened recently, you know, with a, a very prominent case was, you know, people started getting, you know, word of this and, and and realizing, hey, wait a minute, you know, some of my funds are at risk. So they go and and start running to withdraw their funds from the bank. And that obviously exasperates everything until it reaches a critical point. So what does an effective deposit growth strategy look like? And is it the same for all financial institutions, whether you're a large bank or a small credit union? Sure. A great question. You know, I think an effective deposit growth strategy really is a mix of art and science. First and foremost, it's imperative to leverage precision data to understand the share of household wallet that a financial institution has. So the institution needs a surgical-like knowledge of the deposit opportunity for their existing customers and also that same understanding for prospective customers that are in their markets. Messaging and offers, they really have to have this air of personalization so that the bank or the credit union can pierce through the flood of offers and messages when the environment is so competitive. When you consider the nuances across banks and credit unions for their deposit growth strategies, I really think a lot of the actions, the fundamental actions are the same, but the approach may be slightly different. So as an example, a credit union may choose to target households in their markets that are likely to hold, let's say, 25000 or more in deposits with more of a member-centric strategy, whereas that same deposit targeting threshold for a regional or a national bank may be a bit higher as those banks will lean more towards mass affluent populations, so those with 100000 or more in investable assets or deposits, as well as in affluent populations upwards of a million dollars. I think it also depends on the audience and whether that credit union has a simultaneous objective to simply increase the member base. So as an example, a credit union may choose to target a segment or a slice of their portfolio over their customer base and focus on, let's say, the indirect auto portfolio, where member affinity is not quite as strong. The, the brand doesn't resonate as much with those customers, but there's still an opportunity for them to grow deposits because there is a foot through the door, so to speak. So then, Mark, what is the role of data in a deposit growth strategy? But, you know, as mentioned previously, I think utilizing differentiated data and insights is it's really a non-negotiable for any deposit growth strategy in the current environment or, or really any environment for that matter. So here at Equifax, we facilitate the IXI Consortium, which is a network of banks, credit unions, brokerage insurance, directly marketed mutual fund companies that share anonymous consumer asset and position level data at a very granular level, which is then modeled to provide an industry-leading measure of household wealth. Banks and credit unions have to first understand the share of household wallet, as mentioned, so they can identify the deposit growth opportunity, what we call deposits held away within their existing customer base. And then next, they need to understand who within their market has the financial capacity to take advantage of special offers, such as teaser raids or cash incentives. We also think it's imperative that an institution understands the various types of assets that a household has, so messaging can be appropriated to the household. 
a capability that we stand by is the ability to understand household assets in total. So what are the various types of assets that a household has? Deposits, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, annuities, all with a continuous dollar amount, meaning a pinpointed estimate of household deposits or assets, as opposed to a range of deposits or assets, which many of our competitors use. I think it's also important to understand uh, the various characteristics of existing customers and prospects, such as demographic or life stage attributes, geographic, are they urban dwellers or rural dwellers, psychographic characteristics, such as household formation, and then also needs, motivations, preferences, attitudes, lifestyles, really behavioral data to help reinforce deposit growth offers. So data-driven marketing is a process of placing the right message in front of the right customer at the right time through the right channel. And all of this calls for accurate and trustworthy insights uh, that strengthen each consumer touch point so that the institution can drive deposit growth opportunities through the funnel. Yeah. And I would just add to that as what Mark laid out, you know, starting from the understanding the uh, off us, you know, that, you know, where are the opportunities, you know, in our market that we can target to bring in additional deposit growth. Everything from understanding that through all of the, the demographic, psychographic, and other data available to us that he went through to sort of create those strategies to bring in, that can even be brought the next step when you're looking beyond, okay, once we have this consumer as a, as a deposit you know, customer, what then? You know, how can we look at them from a risk standpoint? How can we look at them from a broadening financial perspective that, that not only goes beyond that, that new deposit account or, or that increased deposit amount, but lends itself off to the, the next stage of lending you know, credit, credit products? So given the current environment, are all institutions struggling to hold on to or grow deposits or are some doing better than others when it comes to that? I think it's very clear some institutions are better poised to maintain and grow deposits than others. In competitive periods, customer or member loyalty and brand affinity really prove their value. So institutions that have done a better job at creating stickiness through cross-sell or white glove service ease of business through market presence, and also catering to various segments such as retirees or conversely millennial and Gen Z populations with tech forward offerings. They've all given themselves a competitive advantage. Also organizations that have historically embraced data as a means of deposit growth and maintenance activities have models existing and strategies in place that provide a first mover like advantage in the current environment. But with all that being said, I don't think it's too late for banks or credit unions that are somewhat behind the curve to create a data-centric strategy combined with a compelling offer so they can entice depositors to move some, if not all of their existing deposit savings relationships. This really is all about action and fighting through institutional norms or practices so that the institution can protect the existing deposit base and also take the activities that are necessary to grow deposit relationships for existing customers and prospective customers in the markets. What market? laid out at the onset there with many consumers moving into different you know, savings options, treasury bills and things that I mentioned at the onset. We have seen that that's not a blanket statement, that the, the white glove service, those, that membership focus for the credit unions or the, the customer first focus that a lot of banks and, and on a local, regional and even national level have taken has an impact. And so, you know, we're not saying, oh, well, every consumer is just going to go to the highest you know, savings rate that they find. All of those other factors have a have a big point in that. But also to, to Mark's point, that's not carte blanche to do just whatever you, you feel like. You know, they will move and they do move. And so using that data centric strategy to not only gain new deposits, but also to protect you know, what you have already is key at this point. So is this a short-term issue? How likely are we to be talking about this at the end of the year? Yeah, I think this is priority one for all deposit granting institutions. What you're seeing is institutions of all sizes really buckling down and planning for a three-year journey where the environment will be highly competitive uh, and they need to truly use data and have actionable insights so they can protect and, and grow deposit relationships. It also depends on Federal Reserve actions, monetary policies, things that you need a crystal ball to predict. But I think all in all, institutions are 
really buckling down for the long haul. Yeah. And I would quote a, uh, a recent survey by Intra FI asking you know, banks and other FIs, you know, if this is something that, that they foresee for the long haul. And indeed, yes, yeah, about 84% of, of all banks expect an increase in deposit competition you know, for you know, this year into 2024. Well, this has been a very insightful conversation, and thank you both for joining me today. If you enjoyed today's episode, tell your friends about us and subscribe. If you'd like to send us any questions or suggested topics for future episodes, email us at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our Market Pulse webinar series at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. We provide relevant economic and credit insights to help your business ensure you're well positioned to focus on forward and discover hidden risks and opportunities for profitable growth, even during uncertain times. Thanks for listening, and please join us next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.